Hey everybody, you might remember from my community posts uh, recently, well recently when this video was uploaded, that I was uh, taking photos with what was the most disgusting moldy lens I'd ever seen. Literally, like, it, I would put it up to my face and it would smell like someone had put chicken in the garbage disposal and forgotten to run it for three days. Like, it was really bad. So the, what I'm going to do with this video is I'm going to run this through three major segments. We're going to start after the clip that you're seeing here with the uh, with some film photos that I took with this lens on a Minolta XK and a couple on a Minolta X500 before it broke. And then a bunch of digital photos that are going to be straight out of camera or SOOC, S-O-O-C is the acronym for straight out of camera, unedited from the raw files. Then I'm going to take a bunch of different raw files from the that I took of images I took with this lens prior to cleaning it, and I'll we'll see what I can do editing those raw files from this very fungus and mold-ridden lens, and then we'll jump into some after images showing what the Im what the photos looked like after I cleaned the lens. And then for those of you who are interested in how I cleaned this lens, the bulk of this video, um, everything after about the six minute mark, will be me cleaning the lens and explaining the process and what I did and what I found while I was doing it. So without further ado, let's take a look at some of the film shots. All right, so here's five shots taken on Tri-X with the Minolta XK just used at box speed. You probably can't even tell what most of these things are. I gotta say the black and white film with this lens performed the worst. It was unbelievable how bad it was. I kind of expected it to perform better than the Ultra Max, which we'll start seeing now, but it did, it didn't. It didn't, it was so much worse. The Ultra Max did pick up, interestingly, the color of the rust that was mixed in with the mold on the lens. That's why there's a reddish tint to some of these images, especially the outdoor ones. Interestingly, the indoor ones under fluorescent light, of which there was the banana shot at the beginning of the set, retained a greenish hue. So it was curious that the rust coloring on the lens didn't overpower that fluorescent light. Now here are five shots straight out of the camera with the Sony a7S II. After these five shots, what we'll do is we'll alternate straight out of camera and what I did editing this, these types of shots that were taken before it was cleaned. So here's the first shot we're gonna look at a comparison for. This is a couple geese in a field. What I did with this was I duplicated the base layer and then I used multiple layers, including uh, soft light, overlay, and I forget what the other one that I was using a lot of um, it was, but basically everything you're gonna see here, all of these edits were accomplished simply by going into the uh, layers and then mixing different types of layers. Some would use, depending on the specifics of the image, some would need a divide layer, some would need multiple soft light layers at reduced transparency, I'd also use often a luminosity layer that was converted to black and white, and that would allow me to control the individual luminosities of the different color channels. And by doing some of these things, it allowed me to pull what I think is the most that could possibly have been pulled out of this lens, out of it, with this, the A7S II and some Photoshop CS6 um, editing. Ultimately, one of the things I was very surprised and pleased about with this lens was how much sharpness the lens retained. So I was really optimistic that I'd get this thing cleaned up and that it would still be able to produce really sharp images once I got the fungus and uh, the rust off of it. And it turned out there was a, there, there is a considerable amount of fungus on this lens, but also way more rust covering the elements. 
And uh, so that's what gave a lot of these images their reddish hues after the different layers blended. So at any rate, uh, one of the big takeaways here and the thing that surprised me the most was that how bad this lens was, with some work, it was still capable of returning serviceable images. And I would argue that if you have an interest in something like pictorialism, a lens maybe not quite as bad as this one was, could be a really solid tool paired with a good digital sensor and some good editing practices to create some really good pictorialist images. Now let's take a look at some after shots, which are going to start in about three seconds of what the images from this lens looked like after it was cleaned. Yeah. Yeah, that's a heck of a difference. And uh, there's some good sharpness in this lens still. I know I, I when I brought these back and I opened them up and I, I specifically took photos of the same exact subjects a few days later and tried to replicate as many of the same angles as I could. I just thought I mean, you could kind of see the hints of the sharpness in the before photos, but nothing like this. Now, there is some wonkiness because of the fungus that is there was coatings damage and there was coatings separation because of the fungus. So there are some individual soft spots in the lens still. Those are not ever going to go away just because of the way that the lens is. Uh, optics were damaged by the fungus. And so realistically, when we're talking about fungus, it's like the big bugbear in the uh, lens damage world. If you have a few tendrils around the outside, it's really only going to affect your images when they're shot wide open. If you have some big splotches in the middle, that's going to affect your images pretty significantly, especially if they're towards the rear of the lens. Fungus in the front cell, which is to say the elements that are in front of or nearer the subject than the aperture are is less of an issue than fungus that's on the rear elements because the rear elements do more for fine tuning the focus and the image character as it's going to be projected onto the sensor or your film. But as you can see here, I mean, heck, the out of focus area characteristic is still really pleasing. The colors are really good. The contrast is exceptional and the sharpness is way, way better than I honestly expected it to be after cleaning. So now if you'd like to stick around and see how I cleaned it, let's do that in three, two, one now. So there's the lens before I cleaned it. Here are the basic tools we're going to, oh, that's bright. Here are the basic tools we're going to need. Some lens cleaning tissue and wipes, a screwdriver. I'm also going to be grabbing some additional tools. That's some rubbing alcohol, 91% rubbing alcohol. And I'm going to grab some additional tools as I need them, including the cotton swabs. I'll be grabbing a spanner wrench and some hollow rubber cups that are used for disassembling lenses. That little ring there is just a step up ring and it's a convenient place to put screws. And I'm starting to take the lens apart here right now. And then I realized I don't want to do that and I don't have to do that. At this point in the repair, I was still pretty optimistic that I would be able to save the aperture. It was a stupid thought on my part, but uh, once I got the spanner wrench out, I pulled out the rear cell and there you can get a really good look at the rust damage on the rear cell. One of the saving graces for this lens is that the rear cell didn't have that much fungus, nor did it have that much damage to it in the coatings from the fungus. That's the back of the front cell as seen through the lens right now. And you can see some of the rust damage as it's affecting the aperture. Um, but as I was saying, oh, there we go. Most important tool. A glass of bourbon. As I was saying with the uh, the rear cell being the most important for focusing light, if the rear cell on this lens had been damaged by fungus like the front cell was, uh, I don't think this lens would really be usable in any way, shape, or form anymore. It would probably still be a pictorialist lens. So to clean off the lens cell, the first thing I did was wet cotton swabs with 91% rubbing alcohol, and then very gently ran it over the lens cell. I don't, cotton swabs can scratch the coatings on a lens, and you really don't want to be in that situation because that's going to ruin your lens. So when using cotton swabs, which is not something you want to do as a matter of course, it's good to be very gentle with the glass. And then after using the rubbing alcohol, I used the lens cleaner and tissue to clean off any of the smears from the, the cotton swab and the rubbing alcohol. 
because the rubbing alcohol evaporating very quickly tends to leave a lot of smears. And then that really refined the cleaning on the, the rear cell. Now, once I got the front ring off of the camera, or lens rather, what I did was I cleaned it out. There was a lot of grit and sand and uh, also, quite frankly, there was mold on the insides of the rings. And that was, I could feel it when I was using the spanner wrench and the rubber cups there. It was just gritty, just unscrewing all of that. And uh, was just not conducive to the lens coming apart or being put together again very easily. So now that I have the front ring off, I'm gonna take the front cell out of the lens. And this is all of the elements that are in front of or closer to the subject than the aperture. And these old Rokor lenses or rocker, uh, whatever, they are very easy to disassemble and repair. They were very high quality lenses, very well made and intended for repair people to be able to do service on them. So one of the things I learned taking this apart, I was quite surprised that the uh, front cell is held in place both by a screw and ring and actual screws and lots and lots of very disgusting, thick, moldy, sandy grease. So the uh, once I got these screws out and one of the things I do when I repair lenses is I will take a part of the lens and then the screws that held it in place, I'll put them inside of it. That makes it really easy for me to keep the things sorted. And then usually these projects only last, this, this one was exceedingly long. It was 90 minutes from front to end to get this lens disassembled and cleaned. And uh, in that time, I can pretty well remember how the things went together. And then uh, just making sure that the same screws are with the same parts really helps to ensure that everything's assembled correctly when I put it back together. So again, wh what I was doing there was using the rubbing alcohol to clean the uh, grit and the sand and the grime out of the threads that are gonna be used to re-screw the front cell into place, as well as cleaning the fungus as off of the uh and the and the rust also off of the front cell now this at this point i still thought i could save the aperture but this is the getting close to the moment when i realized the aperture was not salvageable and when we get to that part i'll explain why and it, it all has to do with rust and the aperture on these being metal and uh but at any rate after after uh getting that a little bit cleaned up i, I cleaned up the front cell a little, little bit more and then decided to go back to the aperture now key here is that the aperture ring mechanism is spinning but only two blades are popping out and that was like a a, a, a feeling in my gut that i i knew it was probably the end for the aperture because that meant that uh the aperture leaves had probably rusted together and that the act of of triggering the aperture like I just did probably broke them that was a um that was a that was not exactly what happened and when we get to this as I was taking this apart all of a sudden these little tiny metal pieces started just showing up like really tiny it's if you look in that little semicircular brass ring that's underneath my right hand right now uh i'm going to start putting them in there as they turn up and they, they would just keep falling out of the aperture so when we look at an aperture leaf up close there are there's the shape of it that looks kind of like a wing and then it's got a long bean shaped or straight opening and then a small circle that small circle in the aperture that, that, is, that is here, and the way that this one is designed, has a little pin pressed into it at the factory. And that little pin provides a stationary pivot point. That stationary pivot point then allows the long opening to become a track. And that track is what the motion of the aperture slides back and forth on. So when you adjust the aperture ring, there are two pins, the one in the leaf, that stays stationary. And then the one, another one in one of these two circular rings of the aperture that moves. And as that ring in the aperture moves, what's happening is it's moving through that slide in the leaf and that causes the angular motion that we recognize as an aperture stopping down. So now you can see some of those small little pins starting to show up in that semicircular brass ring. What I've done here is I've been putting, I put the leaves themselves straight into the rubbing alcohol and you can see that most of the rust came off now if 
if those little tiny pins had not fallen out. And the reason they fell out was because the leaves had been damaged by rust and the metal in those pins is a different type of metal than the metal in the leaves. So the water that was introduced to the aperture created a bimetal interaction, which caused the, the little holes around those little pins to expand from corrosion and then the pins fell out. So when I would push one of those little tiny pins back into the holes of the leaves, they just fall right through. The leaves had gotten too big. If the aperture had been designed differently and more in kind with the way that apertures were made in the 50s and 60s, which is to say that the pins weren't necessarily pressed into the leaves, uh, then the pivot points would have been built into the two rings of the aperture, not the leaves themselves. And the, the rings, one of them is stationary and one of them moves. If the aperture had been built that way, it would have been salvageable. So uh, this was the, the moment at which I started to realize that it was done and uh, that was going to be that. So um, at any rate, really what the, the thing that killed this lens the most was the water damage because of the, the metal and the corrosion on the inside of the aperture. But at the same time, even though the aperture is dead, and you can see me here trying desperately, well, not desperately, but uh, futilely, to get some of those pins back in to try to rebuild the aperture, one of the thing you can, things you can see here is kind of how this aperture was, was built and the way that it goes together. Apertures are basically all the same. You have leaves, and you have just have, if you're going to take one apart and put it back together, then you just have to... Um, go about lining the pins back up in the slides. So I'm going back through the front cell here and giving it another cleaning because I wasn't really happy with the way the first one turned out. The next thing I'm gonna do here is a trick that I do often when fixing old lenses. Now with this one, because the cleaning was so severe, it damaged some of the internal light damping. On cells like this one, you're looking at the front of it right now, on the back of it, there's an exposed ground glass surface. That ground glass surface at the factory was painted with a black paint, and that was used to prevent internal reflections. If uh, I have used a lens and accidentally taken that paint off and found that it really just dramatically decreased the contrast in the images, went back, reapplied paint, and it was a marked and immediate improvement. So there you can kind of see that paint is a little bit damaged. So I'm gonna grab some uh, Stuart Semple chocolate sauce here. And uh, I love the black 2.0 for this because it dries super quickly and it is super dark. It's, it, to my mind and to the results I've seen with it, it is actually better than what the factory has put on. So I just apply a little bit to a Q-tip and then I just paint it around where that ground glass surface was. If a little bit gets onto the metal, it doesn't matter. It's just fine. And uh, did I miss a spot? It looks like I did. I don't remember if I fixed that or not. But if you get one of the nice things about Black 2.0 is because it's water based, if you get a little bit onto the lens's surface, you can just grab a clean cotton swab and then just clean it off gently. If it dries while you're working with it, just put a little distilled water or rubbing alcohol on a cotton swab and it will come right off. And that leaves you with a very dark finished product on that ground glass surface and a very clean and easily cleaned glass surface. So here I'm putting the lens back together and as you can see by the two rings right above my bourbon glass, uh, I am not bothering to put the aperture back together. In fact, I even took the aperture coupling lever that pops out the back of the lens out of the lens. That way, if it's ever mounted onto another film camera, uh, it won't trick the film camera into misreading the meter reading. It will only be able to meter at f1.7 because the aperture will only work at f1.7. So as I put it back together, I'm also going through and recleaning everything again, just to make sure that I got all of the dirt and grime off and 
was showing up that I was not perfect in getting the dirt and grime off the first time, mostly because of how absolutely filthy the inside of this lens was. And of course, every step of the way, making sure that the elements are clean, because I don't want to get a fingerprint on the inside of this thing or any lens that I repair and then have to go back and re-clean it disassemble it and reclean it. You can see in that image, by the way, some of the coatings damage that was caused by the fungus and the water in this, uh, in this lens. And that really, that coatings damage is what's going to lead to some significant residual softness in this lens as it's, uh, as it's reused in the future. Focus is significantly less stiff than it was, but a little bit, mm, what would be the best word? Not gritty, it feels, it's not stiff, but you could, it, it doesn't feel smooth. So it'd be like the difference between running your thumb over a piece of glass or over a piece of 4,000 grit sandpaper. So um, I'm gonna use the same technique here on the rear cells, even though they don't necessarily need it, to add some of the black 2.0 paint to the ground glass surface. The I didn't damage the black finish on these ones nearly as badly as I did on the front cell, but at the same time, I figured one thing that would be good to do would be to add it just to help the lens as much as possible eliminate internal reflections. Now, I did put on a really thick layer on this rear cell here, significantly thicker than on the front cell. So I grabbed a, a rocket blaster or bulb blaster, whatever it is, and I'm just gently blowing air onto the paint here, which, as you can see right in front of your eyes in real time, is drying it. So now just grab one of the little hollow rubber cups and just a matter of getting the uh, rear cell threaded back into the lens, which is always a bit tricky. It doesn't matter who made the lens. It doesn't matter what lens it is. This is one of the trickiest parts to get reseated correctly and to get the threads in the raceways. I don't know why. Maybe it's the way I hold the lens. Once the uh, rear cell gets going and you get it screwed in as far as you can, now it's time to grab that spanner wrench. I have a really bad habit. I only tighten the screws on one side of the spanner wrench and then basically hold it like chopsticks. And that allows me to adjust it as needed as I'm using the, uh, the wrench. So far, I've never scratched a lens element doing it that way, but I'm pretty sure that if I ever do, I will stop using the spanner wrench in that way. Now here it is completely reassembled. And you can see now there's only the one peg which communicates the aperture, the maximum aperture to the camera, and the, ap the stop down lens peg is not there. So now I'm gonna give this a really quick test to see how it works. And uh, we're just gonna put it right on the a7S II as we film this. The video quality of this lens is so much, so much worse than the still quality. And I think that there was some residual humidity from my hands putting this back together and maybe even some rubbing alcohol on some of the raceways as I had assembled this. And that led to what we're going to see here being an incredibly soft and hazy looking uh, image in this video. And as you saw from the stills earlier on, it didn't look like that. So whatever is causing this haziness did eventually go away. So that's the process and the results. Thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.